questions. So don't feel like you have to, uh, I don't want just, just to be all lecture. So I'd love participation. And, and this one might be a little more lecture just at the beginning uh, because I wanna paint the background for this book. Um, and yet I would, uh, I would love participation. So uh, especially when we get into the text, I think that'll be a wonderful way for us to interact with each other and try to figure out what Hebrews, Hebrews is saying. Hebrews is a really hard book to understand at points. So I would love to, um, love to get your mind on some, of the, on some of the harder passages. So I'm gonna try to share my screen now. And even if you can't see the screen, if you're driving or something, that's okay. I will still, uh, I'll still verbally be going through all of it. All right, so Hebrews, if you could, if you could sum up Hebrews in, in five words, which would be really hard to do, one way you might do it is saying, Jesus is better, so persevere. Sometimes, sometimes it's good just to have one simple phrase to capture the meaning of the book. Jesus is better, so persevere. Now look at, look at two different commentaries and, and how they explain the main idea of Hebrews. One is from the ESV Study Bible, and one is from a professor at Bethlehem College and Seminary, Andy Nacelli. Would, would someone read both of these main ideas and then let's think together, how are, how are these similar? What, what things are both of these definitions of the main idea highlighting? Can someone read these for us? I can read them. Um, Christ is greater than any angel, priest, or old covenant institution. Thus, each reader, rather than leaving such a great salvation, is summoned to hold on by faith to the true rest found in Christ and to encourage others in the church to persevere. And Jesus is better, so persevere. Okay. So two different, two different versions of the main idea, but uh, what, are, what are some of the parallels you see between both of them? They both reference Christ's supremacy. The, the first one's a lot more specific. Yeah, exactly. So look, look at how they're related. Christ is greater, and then Jesus is better. So no matter what, what commentary you look at or what study Bible, everyone recognizes that Hebrews is a book about the supremacy of Christ. And, and so that's going to be a major theme that we have throughout the book of Hebrews. And that's, that's really important to recognize because the, the recipients, those who are receiving this letter, they were tempted to leave the faith, to leave the Christian faith. They were tempted to possibly go back to Judaism or, or some other religion or just to chuck it all together. And... Um, and part of the reason they were wanting to do that is because they were facing increasing persecution for naming the name of Christ. And, and if, if you look at our culture, this might be true of us in, in, the, in the years and decades to come. And so um, we want to learn from Hebrews what we can in order that we might persevere. So you see, you see in both definitions here, Christ is greater, Jesus is better. And then you also see that because of that, we should stay true to Christ. We should stay true to Christ. We should persevere, and we need to encourage each other to do that. So those are, those are two looks at what the main idea of this book are. Now, why should we, why should we study Hebrews? Well, first of all, it is a magnificent book on Christ's person 
and work. It's remarkable to, to sit down and soak in Jesus's priestly work, the finality of his sacrifice, the nature of his, his, his uh, sonship, and then what that means for our life. And so if you want a deeper, richer fellowship with Jesus Christ, I encourage you to soak yourself in this book. This is a, a majestic book about Christ's person and his work. Another reason is it's really a good model for interpretation. The author's extensive use of the Old Testament enables us to explore how first century Christians read the Old Testament. Have, have any of you ever been reading the, the New Testament and the way they use an Old Testament quote makes you kind of go, huh? I don't think that was, that was what the New Testament, I, that's not how I read that Old Testament text. Well, Hebrews will enable us and allow us to understand a little bit better how the first century church used the Old Testament. And, and there's a lot that we can, a lot that we can learn from that. Another reason to study Hebrews, we, we learn about the people of God. We learn about ourselves. It sheds light on our understanding of how the people of God move from being Israel under the old covenant. And that's what we're reading now in Exodus, right? What, what does it look like to be a part of the old covenant of God? And now how God has shifted to the church. The church is his people under the new covenant. And that, that is so essential to understand in the Christian life in, in order to walk in maturity, in order to understand what it is that God is calling us to be and do as a church. Um, that's so crucial to understand. And, and there's so much we can learn from Hebrews about that. And then, the, and then the final reason to study Hebrews, among many, many, many others, but here are just some summary summary reasons, is perseverance. Hebrews exhorts Christians to persevere, giving a clear warning against apostasy and the comfort provided by religious externalism. And that last about its writing is a typo. I have no idea why that's there. <laughs> so Hebrews exhorts Christians to persevere, giving a clear warning against apostasy and the comfort provided by religious externalism. Now, let's unpack that a little bit. What, what does apostasy mean? And what does it mean by comfort provided by religious externalism? Any ideas on that? What does, what does apostasy mean? I was going to ask that. <laughs> You're going to ask that question. So well, I beat you to it, Laura. <laughs> um, it like you're renouncing faith. Yeah, exactly. It's it's renouncing faith. It's it's at one point naming the name of Christ, and then and it doesn't mean just simply falling into a sin. It means completely publicly then renouncing that faith. So uh, you think about. Um, oh, what was his name? He wrote, I Kiss Dating Goodbye. Joshua Harris. Josh Harris. Would be a modern day example of what appears to be, we are praying it's not, but what appears externally to look like apostasy. Joshua Harris was an evangelical pastor. Um, I mean, I, I heard messages from him. I read his books. This guy was solid super solid and then he renounces it all and and that that's that's really troubling to my soul and and i think per, i think hebrews will help us understand that and can someone lose their salvation i mean can someone be as close to god as joshua harris apparently was and then chuck it all there, there are some disturbing questions that, that are, are clamoring in our souls as we look at 
faith leaders fall away. And another pastor who I listened to growing up, uh, James McDonald, I don't know if you know him, but he used to come and preach at Moody. He was a, he was a, a pastor of Harvest Bible Chapel uh, right, right outside of Chicago. I used to give my friends his sermons. He was so spot on, uh, just a preacher of righteousness. And, and he just has completely fallen off the rails. And, and you think, man, if, if these, what look like godly men can, can have such a fall into apparent apostasy, how can we guard our own souls against that? And how can we also at the same time have assurance that God will keep us? Well, that, that's what Hebrews is all about. That's what Hebrews is all about. So when it talks about comfort provided by religious externalism, essentially it's meaning that some of the folks here wanted to go back to uh, Judaism, to the, to the uh, giving of physical sacrifices and just kind of hide under that religious structure and not really have a, a deep inner walk with Jesus. Any comments or questions so far before we continue? Okay, so let's go to the next screen. Did Paul write Hebrews? Now, if any of you are able, through your scholarship, to figure out this question, you will be on the front of Time Magazine, I promise. Because thousands of scholars have tried to figure out who in the world wrote Hebrews. And to this day, after thousands of years of inquiry, no one knows who wrote this majestic book. Um, some think it was Paul, but the problem is it doesn't sound like him. It uses different words, Greek words that than he usually uses. It just doesn't have the feel of Paul. And, and so hardly anybody today uh, defends Pauline authorship of Hebrews. Another reason is you'll notice whenever you open up a Pauline epistle like Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, um, Paul always self-identifies himself. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus to the church of Corinth. Paul, a servant of Christ to the church of Thessalonica. He always identifies himself. Well, there's nothing like that here in Hebrews. Also, it's almost impossible to believe that Paul would identify himself as one of those who heard the gospel, not from the Lord, but from those who heard him. So that this book says that the author heard the gospel from others. Well, that couldn't have been Paul because he himself heard it from Christ. He, he met Christ. So some of the other suggested authors include Barnabas, Apollos, Aquila, and Priscilla, Silas, Timothy, Epaphras, the deacon Philip, Mary, the mother of Jesus, Luke, and Clement of Rome. Do any of you have a strong opinion about this you want to share? I think Sandy, Sandy thinks it's Mary, the mother of Jesus. Is that right, Sandy? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> um, she can't unmute herself, otherwise she'd be rebuking me right now. <laughs> no, we don't know who wrote it, okay? But thankfully, that doesn't, that doesn't hinder our ability to interpret the book. Now, a little more background. Where was Hebrews written? Well, the only explicit reference we have to location is in 1324, where it says, those from Italy send you their greetings. So Rome is mentioned here. Now, that, that's helpful to a degree. Somehow this, this church is included in what's happening. However, we don't know if this indicates that the letter was written to Rome or from Rome, uh, or it may indicate neither. <laughs> so it's, it's, not, it's not great uh, evidence either one way or the other. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that persecution in Rome was hot. 
during this time. And so um, I think that could be one evidence of why Hebrews was actually written to recipients in Rome, because, because persecution was so hot, and it's obvious that those going through, um, through uh, persecution um, were the recipients of this book. When was Hebrews written? Any time between 80, 60, and 100 is possible, but most likely before AD 70. Now, I want you to put on your, uh, your scholar, scholarly hats on and look at that picture off to the right. And, um, and from that picture, that gives you a hint of why this probably was not written after AD 70. Can anyone figure out my little quiz here? So it have to do with the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem? Yes, look at that. Um, burning buildings. It was, it, was, it was kind of eerie to find this picture after driving into Minneapolis Saturday morning and seeing flames and smoke, but that's exactly what happened to Jerusalem. Exactly. And, and that was the destruction of the temple when uh, Titus, the emperor of Rome, came in and he sacked Jerusalem, and, and he, um, he burned down the temple. And so after AD 70, you didn't have sacrifices being offered anymore. And when you read Hebrews, he talks about sacrifices still being offered. So most likely, Hebrews was written as a Jewish temple was still up and running. Otherwise, he wouldn't mention it in the present tense. Who is Hebrews written to? Now, again, um, scholarship isn't very helpful here. We just don't know a lot about this book, about who it was written to and who from. Some say Alexandria, Antioch. I already said I think it's Rome. Um, but there, there are at least some of the options there to the bottom left. Ephesus, Jerusalem, Samaria. Uh, we're just not sure, but again, answering those questions aren't necessary to interpret this book. All right, good. Any other any questions so far or comments? I don't know if you guys have ever read anything about the destruction of of Jerusalem in AD 70. But it was absolutely horrific. I, I read a book recently about the whole week spanning up until the destruction, and and it was cataclysmic. It was it was awful. You know, you had um, Jews protecting the temple at all costs, and and uh, history says that that blood was shed um, so profusely that even the streets were covered. In blood. It, it was a horrible, horrible, horrible time. And that's why some biblical interpreters, when they read the book of Revelation, when they, they read about end time events that, that, that um, are painted as so bleak, they think it's actually talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. And they say that was the second coming of Jesus when Jerusalem was, was destroyed. So every time you hear Paul saying Jesus is going to come back quickly, he already came to judge Jerusalem in AD 70. And, and, and uh, that, that's called amillennialism. Um, anyway, that, that's for another topic. They still believe the rapture is going to come. Um, but that's how, that's how uh, horrible this event was when Jerusalem was destroyed. Now, look over to the right a little bit. Jonathan Worthington sent me these pictures, and it's from the Babylon Bee. I, I don't know if you've ever heard of or read the Babylon Bee, uh, but it's basically Christian satire. It's, it's meant just to give Christians a laugh. It's written by pastors, and um, this graphic over here are the different ways that pastors can gain the attention of people in the audience. And I, I don't think we'd sanction any of these at Jubilee, but 
One would be endless sports analogies. To be an effective preacher, it takes uh, balls and other sports equipment. So get them, you know, <laughs> show, show them sports stuff. Or get choked up mid-sentence. Make sure it looks involuntary, then apologize, but not really. Sudden outburst of holy rage. Aim for at least three heart attacks per service. Or a lit PowerPoint with movie clips. Use clips from R-rated films so kids pay attention. Or uh, pyrotechnics. Try to emit a sparkly blast every time you say, Jesus. <laughs> or perform the healer's... What is that word? Hadouken? To learn this, you must train under Sensai Hin for years. Anyways, you get the point. It just, it's, it's, it's mocking how sometimes we preachers are tempted to gain the attention of our people in ways that don't draw attention to the text. They actually draw attention away from the Bible. But I, I show you this because there's something very unique about Hebrews that's different than any other book in the Bible. And that is that Hebrews is most likely either a sermon or a series of sermons formed or formatted into a letter. And if you've ever read Hebrews, you'll notice it has a different feel. There's an exhortational quality to it. You can imagine yourself sitting in the pew, hearing this word preached over you. And, and, and Hebrews even says it's a word of exhortation. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation. And so this is a very unique book. And all over this epistle, we still call it an epistle because it was used as a letter, but all over this epistle, you can tell it was preached because all these rhetorical devices, all these different ways of grabbing a, an audience's attention is used in order to drive home the point of the author. So I would encourage you, this will be your homework this week, is to sit down and read the whole book of Hebrews in one sitting as if it were a sermon. It, that's a powerful thing to do. My, my professor at, at Moody used to have us sit down and read whole books of the Bible at one time. And there's something powerful that happens when you do that. So I'd encourage you to do that through Hebrews. Now, that doesn't mean you can't pause, get a cup of coffee, go to the bathroom, but maybe in one day, make it your goal to read through the book of Hebrews and, and see what God will do in your heart. Okay, I'll pause there. Any, any other questions or comments? We got, we're almost done here. We got about two minutes left. So Hebrews is written to get your attention in a godly way, not in using a t-shirt cannon like you see pictured there below. Or the summoning of the she-bears for when youth smart off during your sermon. You, got, you guys remember what happened <laughs> when the prophet was made fun of by the youth? He called she-bears to come and eat them all up. Uh, Lou and I have talked about that when we've done JYC at times. But, um, I also reference this often. Yes, just, it's, it's, per, it's a great, great thing to reference. <laughs> All right, now this is the last page, so we'll, we'll be done on time. Uh, there's two Greek words I think it'd be good for you to be familiar with when you look at the book of Hebrews, and it's parakaleo and parakalesis. And th those are two words from the same, same root word, um, meaning to exhort, encourage, and comfort. And, and you'll see these words repeatedly throughout this text, is exhort, encourage, and comfort. And that's something the gospel not only does for us, this is important, but this is also what we're called to do for one another. And so I think about this time right now that we're walking through. I think about the comfort we need. I think about the encouragement. I think all of us between COVID and all that's happened aren't at 
you know, aren't feeling emotionally great all the time. And that's where the church steps in and is meant to encourage, comfort, and exhort one another. So listen, listen to these few verses. I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. Hebrews 3.13, but exhort one another every day. So what Hebrews is doing to you when you read it, you're called to do to other believers in this time. Hebrews 6, so that by two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement, Paraclesis or paraclesis. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. There it is again, that same Greek word for exhort, encourage, parakaleo. And you have forgotten the word of exhortation that addresses you as sons. My son, do not regard the discipline of the Lord. So recognize that what Hebrews invites us into is a way of fellowship where we are so connected in each other's lives that we are able to do this for one another. We're able, one, to know the gospel well enough so that we're encouraged by the word of God, and B, that we're able then to take that same word and encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, I, I, I'll end on this, but I ran into a neighbor. Um, I told some of you this. I ran into a neighbor at at 38th in Chicago yesterday. His name's Phil. He's African-American. I don't think he's a believer. Uh, we, and, and we just started talking and he, um, he was just sharing his sorrow. And I talked about how, you know, one day our only hope is in the judgment and justice of God because only he can get all this right. And, and as I said that, he just began to weep. And you never know when a word of exhortation or encouragement God will use to bring a profound effect. And so soak in the word of God, soak in Hebrews in order that you might encourage others. So here's your Hebrews, here's your uh, homework, guys. Read through the whole book of Hebrews this week, okay? And if you can't, still join us next Thursday, but read through the whole book of Hebrews. And as you do that, answer these questions, okay? According to Hebrews, Jesus Christ is better than what? And why? Secondly, professing Christians should be aware of what? When Christians read this book, what, what do they need to take vigilant care that they don't fall into? And then three, what is new about the new covenant? And the way you answer that determines the rest of your theology. What is new about the new covenant? All right, friends. Well, I want to end us on time. Um, will someone pray for us? And, and listen, if you guys ever want to get coffee or talk more about this book, uh, I would love to do that. So we'll just do a half an hour now. But if there are other times during the week you want to FaceTime, you have questions, um, I would love to do that. So, Deborah, would you pray for us? Close us in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time to gather and learn from your word. I pray that um, you would just really instruct our hearts over the summer as we study, um, that you would be honored in our pursuit of you, that you would just enrich our understanding of who Christ is and what the new covenant means. We thank you for your love. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Love you all. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. How long have you been home? <clears throat> uh, I uh, I got home. Um, we got home yesterday. Okay. Yeah. So. Um,